All right, welcome. So before we get back to partial pivoting and LU, I wanted to give you a few, oh, I guess, organizational updates or something. I got lots of feedback from you, which is great. I encourage that. I would react to it a little bit. Uh, homework number one is now graded, so you can check it out. There were some small mistakes, but there was a lot of them. <laughs> If you have some questions, I guess the TAs are best qualified to answer them. They were grading your homeworks at the first place. I released the project number two as of today. So we changed it, if you were not here on Monday, we, uh, so it will be due next Wednesday. So I hope, hope that will uh, work uh, better. I got, uh, let's see. <coughs> yeah, about the project one, some people were slightly confused about what exactly you were expected to do and so on. So. I discussed it that I, I, my initial reaction was to be like a little more specific in the project descriptions, but then I discussed it with my colleagues and actually I was told that this is perfectly fine. The project descriptions not meant to be perfect. That's because problems you'll be solving in the real life, they will be actually way more way than that. Like a famous example, if, if you will be working, some people will be working in an animation studio, like on some sort of, I guess, let's say, fluid simulation technology and a director comes to you, your boss and say, hey, the waves look great, but I would like them to look a little more angry. <laughs> it's like very way request, right? What does it mean for your solver, for your our simulation parameters to, to, to do that? So yeah, and also if you leave the work until the day of the deadline, then you may be disappointed. So. <laughs> Some of you might have to learn the hard way. It's better not to leave the stuff at the last moment. Okay, so that's this. Oh yeah, another thing, some, some people were asking about the midterm, what shall you expect? I just posted on Piazza. So the question was like, it's like still like a month before, before the midterm. So I think it's too early to think about it because we still have a lot of material to cover before, before we can get to the midterm. But just to give you a, like an overview of what, what is actually going on, I, I might have explained it briefly before, but let me go over it again, just to, so you have an idea what to expect what, or what will be expected from you. So here, uh, uh, the homeworks and the projects, that's mostly MATLAB programming. That's the applied part of the course, which is a big part, actually, a big, big part of the grade, right? <coughs> And as I said, the midterm and the exam that that will be on the paper on paper e exams. No, I'm not gonna look it up now. I don't want to waste time with that. You can go to Piazza. I posted our practice midterm problems, which we will do before the midterm. So before the midterm, we will do a little bit of practice and so on. Just in case you were already anxious and wondering how is the midterm gonna look like, you can take a look at look at it immediately. In case you were so proactive that you wanted to prepare to work on your math kung fu already, that's that's what you will need to do at the midterm. You can uh, use the textbook, Gilbert Strang's Introduction to Linear Algebra, and you'll have to find a zillion practice problems. So if you, if you do some of those, you'll get an idea what the problems are like in the practice midterm thing, but all, all the problems in the book, they are equ equally relevant and could, could also easily appear there. Does that make sense? Does it, uh, yeah? You said it's two classes, right? Two classes? Correct, yes. Maybe a three hour I think so, yeah. I think I'll split it into like two pieces. It's a little bit different because I'm changing the format from last year. I haven't completely decided. Is that okay or? <laughs> Is that too much or, <laughs> or shall I do less? I haven't completely decided what I want to do. I, 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 I would welcome your feedback. We could do one and do less problems, I guess. <laughs> the, the last, the, yeah? What's your, what's your reason for having uh, two parts instead of just one? Like well, the reason is so you don't have really have to rush it and you, do, you can check it after yourself. <laughs> The, the, the thing is that I have like a few problems. The problem should be covering what, what we had. And I just split it in two parts. If we, I, I could also give it all of them at, at one class <laughs> if you would prefer that. <laughs> but I, I thought I can be generous with the time so we can like go over some questions if you don't understand something. And most importantly, that you can actually check your results because like it's one thing I think you should, you should really learn. Like everybody can, try it and either get it right or wrong. But like if, if I talk in terms of programming, the, the really good programmers are the ones who are aware of the fact that they are making mistakes and they will be making mistakes no matter what. So they know how to check and defend against their mistakes. I mean, that's, that's what I was doing when I was doing exams, like try if, if the things, like if you are solving a linear system, the least you could do is to, to substitute it there and see, see if you got it right, right? So. 
if you are in a, in a hurry, you might not be able to do that. So I guess that's my rationale for that. <laughs> but if you have some more, I haven't set anything in stone yet. I still have to plan it and how, how will we proceed and so on, how to hone a homework, homework project, homework assignments and projects are going. So I'm still open to suggestions. <laughs> it's really, the midterm is really more mostly for you rather than for me. It's only like 15 or something percent of the grade. So it's not that big of a deal. Any other questions there? Oh, in terms of taking notes, I, I, I would hope that the classes I'm recording for you and putting on YouTube, that they would um, serve as your notes. If you want to copy it on the paper, which is a good idea, then uh, if you, if you want to do it later from the YouTube recording, that would be great. I was hoping to do, uh, my motivation for doing this was that I was hoping that we could interact better in the class if you don't have to worry about writing everything down. <laughs> So we can have a little more interaction like I'm asking questions and so on. Okay, so shall we get back to business? Our, um, our pivoting, our partial pivoting. So uh, uh, before I dive into the slide, I need to explain a little bit about permutation matrices, but let, let me just motivate this. What did we end with uh, the last time was that when we are solving linear systems, we need to be conscious about rounding errors, right? Almost always when you are computing, doing <coughs> numerical computations, arithmetic <coughs> computations on the computer, almost always there are rounding errors. Like not always, you can, you can do exact arithmetics. There are some software packages that, that support that. I don't know if MATLAB has exact arithmetics, do you know? It might have some module with exact arithmetics. I know that like the Mathematica or Maple, they, they certainly do support exact arithmetics, and some libraries do support exact arithmetics. The punchline is you probably don't want to use it anyway because it's so slow. If you are crunching through large matrices, which is really the main point, then the ma this starts getting really interesting when you have a lot of data, big matrices, and so on. In that case, you definitely need to accept the fact that you will have rounding errors in your results. And the way to defend yourselves against it when solving linear systems is by doing partial pivoting. And you can do row scaling too, and you can also do column scaling and full pivoting. But usually the partial pivoting and row scaling takes care of most of the problems. So to uh, give this a little nicer matrix picture, the partial people think, I want to explain a little bit about permutation matrices. It's sort of a cute little thing, which will be also useful when we will be talking about a determinant later in the course. So what are permutation matrices? There's a special type of matrices which only have elements zero or one. So I guess you could call it a binary matrix, special type of binary matrix. I guess, so this, what, what I mean by this notation, oh wait, is it doing this? No, it's good. So I mean that this is like a set of n binary numbers, like zero or one, and I have an n by n array of them. But not, I guess that could be called like a binary matrix. And a permutation matrix is not an arbitrary binary matrix, but a special type of binary matrix, such that on every row and every column, you have exactly one one. So for example, this would be an example of a three by three uh, permutation matrix. So the condition is on every row and every column, there is exactly one one and the rest of them are zeros. Okay. So it's like um, towers on the checkerboard. If you place n towers on the checkerboard, so they are not attacking each other or something, that's, 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 that's a permutation matrix. Okay, I guess I should write it in line. Exactly, ex 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 exists exactly one, one in each row and column. Okay, so it will be obvious immediately what, what is this useful for? Because if I apply this matrix, let's take this one, Try to rem uh, remind yourself of the elementary row transformation matrices we discussed on Monday. So if I take this matrix and I multiply with the matrix of rows A1, A2, A3, so those are, so this is another three by three matrix. And these A1, A2, and A3 are uh, row vectors. So what do I get? by this matrix multiplication. Any ideas? So 
So certainly this is a three by three, right? So cer certainly it will be a three by three matrix, but what will be the elements? Or what does this matrix do? Can you, can you see it? Is the, is the focus good enough? Yeah, oh yeah, sorry about that. I, I thought that was a bit weird. I need to do the autofocus lock. Now it's better, right? <laughs> okay, good. Okay. So, who can see <laughs> what does the matrix do? Swaps rows, exactly. In this case, swaps rows one and two are permutes, right? That's why it's called permutation matrix. Does everybody see that? Because what, what, what do I do? I multiply with the first row, all of the rows. So if I, if I hit everything with zero, one, zero, that means just I extract the second row, right? So this will be a two, this will be a one, and this will be a three. Right. So this is indeed. So this is that's why it's called permutation matrices, because what they do is they, they permute rows when I multiply with the permutation matrix from the left. OK, guess what happens if I multiply with the permutation matrix from the right? So let me take another matrix. Now I take the column vectors, a, a1, a2 and a3. Let's take the same permutation matrix. Why not? 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. What does it do in this time? This time? So it's almost the same except that I'm multiplying with it from the right. So like immediately or should be like a part of your brain that should like trigger the non-commutativity red flag, right? So you can't expect that to be the same in general, right? So how it will differ? Exactly, swap columns, yes. This occurs in all, just like duality occurs in algebra all the time. Oh, no, 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 I take the duality back. That would only confuse you. There are other types of duality. But the, the fact that you can be looking at the matrix, uh, watch this, you can be looking at the matrix always like this or like this. That will be matrix transposition, which I'll, I'll discuss in a little bit, or maybe you already know this. So everybody sees why does this permute columns. When I multiply from the right, it permutes columns. When I multiply by the permutation matrix from the left, it permutes rows. So now you see why permutation, everybody sees that? So uh, now you see why permutation matrices are useful when we are talking about reordering, right? Because just like when I said it's cool to be able to represent Gaussian elimination using matrix multiplication, here we can also do the pivoting using matrix multiplication. So everything is nice. Everything can be expressed in the language of matrices, um, which is nice. So well, there are some cool properties of permutation matrices. Uh, well, let me try to ask the broad question. Do you see some special property of a permutation matrix? We talked before about rotation matrices. That's a little broader question. We talked about orthonormal matrices. And it turns out that all the permutation matrices are actually very easy to see, that they actually are orthonormal. Right? What was the definition of an orthonormal matrix? Those things, by the way, like the definitions and so on, it, you, I assume you will remember that for the midterm. It's not a whole lot to remember, like what is orthonormal and what, what, what are the basic properties of operations of vectors and so on, but these things you just um, must remember. Yep? So there's that between columns right there, and then each column ends up the one. Yeah, so that's trivially satisfied here, right? Because I said in every row, <laughs> So in, our, in every column there is exactly one one, and in every row there is also one one. So it's like the towers. So there's no way the one could meet, right? That would violate violate the row. If I had one here and one here, that would mean I have two row, two ones in a row. So that's not possible. So indeed, the dot product of every columns or every two columns or every two rows doesn't really matter. That's zero, and all of them are unit vectors, right? It's just one one. The rest of them are zero. So clearly, all permutation matrices are <coughs> orthonormal. So I guess I could like draw like a little picture like this. So let's imagine here, here is an identity. Identity, of course, is a permutation matrix, right? So permutation matrices, P would be a set like this. We might set of permutation matrices. Identity would be in there. 
then I would have a bigger set of orthonormal matrices, right? And then I would have a set of all n by n matrices. So there is like these this levels of like special properties if you want to think about it like this. Like clearly there are orthonormal matrices which are not permutation matrices, right? They take some non-trivial rotation that that does it, right? So that's an example of a matrix that's here, but not, but it's not a permutation, right? And of course there are matrices which are not orthonormal. That's, that's obvious, like non-uniform scaling. <coughs> Now another cool thing about permutation matrices, if I take two permutation matrices, P1 and P2, then P1 times P2, guess what? Will still be a permutation matrix, right? Because uh, what does, so well, think about it for a second. So I have two permutation matrices, P1 and P2, and applying P1 means permute Let's, let me get it right, permute the rows of P2, right? But if you think about the definition, it remains to be permutation even if after permuting the rows, right? Again, not attempting a formal proof, but I just want to give you the gist of the, the that's the key idea, right? That I, can, I can flip the, swap the rows arbitrarily and the, the property will still <coughs> hold the permutation matrix. So indeed, this is still a permutation matrix. Okay, and using permutation matrices, I can write down the, I guess, the, the theorem about existence of LU decomposition. We talked before about LU decomposition, how it's useful for solving linear systems, right? So the existence of polar decomposition, unfortunately, is not always granted. Uh, what, sorry, what am I saying? LU decomposition, of course. I don't know where the polar came from. Maybe from my e earlier research meetings. <laughs> so if I give you an arbitrary square matrix, and even if it's invertible, the LU decomposition does not always have to exist. Do you, do you remember what's the problem when the LU decomposition, I mean, just running the, the Gaussian elimination when, when it would fail? When we talked about the, the need for partial pivoting, I was saying that if the pivot element is zero, that's a problem, right? Because then you cannot divide with it. Do you want me to, do you want me to show it? Ah, uh, okay, I'll put it somewhere here. Yeah, it was, it was this, this example, this system, right? That was 10 to minus four, so that only created numerical problems. But if there was zero, if there was no, no, no x at all, <coughs> this wasn't there, then the Gaussian elimination fails, right? I guess your code, if you just write a code, that by the way, that's exactly what you'll be writing for your project number two, will divide by zero. That's not good, right? <laughs> Nevertheless, we can, we can uh, state the for following statement. It's gonna be true, existence of LU decomposition. So for every matrix A, so I guess this theorem would be like this, for every matrix A, there exists a permutation matrix P, I guess let me call it, I don't know, perm n by n or whatever, I just made up this notation, such that PA equals LU. So what does it mean? Now you should know what the PA means, right? If I say this, I guess I should say that there exists L lower triangle and U upper triangle. We, we discussed it at length last time, so let me not go through this again. Just that for the existence, you need uh, the permutation matrix there. So PA, what it does, that's exactly what we discussed here. It permutes the rows. And this basically says that for any matrix, I can permute the rows, such that then, oh, for every matrix that's invertible. I, let's, let's assume that it's invertible so that I'm actually correct. <coughs> Then I can permute the row so that the Gaussian elimination succeeds and gives me the LU factors, okay? So this is, this is what corresponds to partial pivoting. So, so PA is what corresponds to partial pivoting. And guess what would be full pivoting? I can, or I, I think it's called complete pivoting. 
<coughs> that means that I allow both a uh, swapping of both rows and columns. So that means that I take two permutation matrices, P1 and P2, and I do this. I do, I permute first the rows and then the columns in whatever order, you, you know that that doesn't matter due to matrix multiplication associativity. And then I find the factors for the twice permuted matrix. That's complete pivoting. You can use that to it. Turns out that it's not uh, usually not necessary, that usually the partial pivoting succeeds. And I think this is also the topic of your, of your uh, I mean, I know that's the topic of your project. So here is the call for LU decomposition in MATLAB. And indeed, yeah, most LUD comes in employ partial pivot thing. And as they do it, they can basically build the corresponding permutation matrix and return the permutation matrix to you. So that's exactly what MATLAB does. If you call LU on the matrix A, it gives you the factors and the permutation <coughs> matrix P such that this equation holds. So now you know what this PA means. It means permute the rows of the matrix E such that after I do this, the LU is the correct decomposition. And it does that so it's actually always possible and to avoid an amplification of the rounding errors as we discussed before. Okay? So there is one more catch. There's one more thing that can go wrong, which has to do with the invertibility condition. So the thing is, even if matrix is strictly mathematically speaking invertible, that's the example of this matrix, it can still be what is called poorly conditioned. So what does it mean? Let's, let's look at this example. So we are solving a very innocent looking two by two system. And the numbers here, they are not crazy. They are like pretty normal numbers. Like it's not like some 10, 10, two minus four, or like the examples I was showing before. Well, are sort of well-behaved numbers, right? Sort of random, but that, that's how your real data will look like. And it turns out that if I, per so, so for this act, for this right hand side, this is my solution, you can verify that. It turns out if I perturb the right hand side just a tiny bit, all I did here was I changed the 0.067 to 0.066. It turns out that the solution changes dramatically, right? The thing is that this is what it is. Those are not rounding errors you would get the same result even if you were computing in absolutely exact arithmetics. The problem is uh, that this is, this is basically what the matrix requires. The problem is that the matrix is poorly conditioned and it's something related to solving one by one system if you had something like this, this there, like some, some right hand side. The problem is that in the matrix, this, this here in a one by one case, it's obvious that you will be amplifying whatever error you have on, a, on Y, right? Like if, if Y are some measurements come from some real data, some millivolts or amperes or temperatures or something, you will have some error there, right? Or even if they are not measurements, but you were like doing like numerical precision things, so you have rounding errors there, you have some error there, epsilon, right? And in this case, you can see that the error is getting amplified insanely, right? A little bit of an error made huge impact on the result. And in this case, that's my main message here, those are not rounding errors. This is, this is the, really the property of the matrix. That's really what the ma matrix is asking for. So if you don't like this, if you wanna fix this, then you really need to do a different matrix. So we will uh, study this in more detail later when, when we know something about matrix decompositions like SVD. That there are uh, linear algebra techniques, S SVD, single value decomposition, is a way to detect the poor conditioning and then do something about it. So we will discuss that later. For now, I would like you to keep this in mind. So basically what's happening is that matrix is invertible in the strict mathematical, mathematical sense, but numerically is just barely invertible. It's like very close to a singular matrix. So that's, that's one way how you can internalize this if it helps. Okay, any question? No? And the last slide in the part on solving linear systems is about the backslash operator, which you probably already know. Who, who knows the backslash operator in MATLAB? Of course, that's, that's like the coolest thing in MATLAB, basically. All, 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 this, 
all these things I've talked about and way more, all, all, all smart tricks about sparse solvers and detecting the structure of the matrix and try, trying to be smart about how to solve a system of inner equations, that's just backslash in MATLAB, okay? So this means if I want to solve a system AX equals B, then I do like uh, A, you can look at it as like divided by <laughs> B. That's the solution. Now, if you will have a um, singular matrix there or something close to singular, something like that case I showed before, it might yell at you and give some warnings and that'd be totally happy about it. <laughs> and that's basically, I guess, the, the, the rest of the course so you understand all, all these problem cases um, and know how to, oh, well, that's, that's exaggerating. It's, but it's a big part of linear algebra to sort of understand what uh, uh, can you do in the case if you have like nearly single matrices and so on. Okay. <coughs> that was good. So the next topic I would like to visit is give you some examples of linear systems because after all this is an applied course and not just the theory but also some cool applications so and there are countless applications of uh, li linear systems so let's start by 1d interpolation that's like a, I guess a little bit of a toy example just so you have a variety of problems where uh, linear systems appear so let's see so the setup here is like this so I have a 1d function I guess uh, or let me say first that I have like some points in on the real line and I have some corresponding measurements so this would be like I guess y1 y2 y3 y4 so let's say I measured some four data and I want to fit a function through the data okay and I, I would like to fit some nice smooth function. So the easiest way to do that is to fit a four degree polynomial. That's exactly this. And we'll look something, some, I guess something like this. Something like this. So you can imagine that you have four points on the plane, which uh, are like, which are measured at points x1, x2, x3, x4. And you want to create a function that interpolates <coughs> them. And the function you choose to interpolate these, these four points is a degree four polynomial, okay? So those would be my, I guess this would be my y1, right? This would be my y2, y2, and so on, okay? So the other way you can look at it that you are interested in the space of four degree polynomials and you know their values at a few samples xi, like this x1, x2, <coughs> x3, and x4, okay? And so that's what we are given. The input is the x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, x4, y4. And what we want to get are the coefficients, a, b, c, d. So we want to basically compute, reconstruct the coefficients. So once we have done that, we can draw this, this nice uh, polynomial, nice smooth polynomial curve, which interpolates the data, right? You should be all able to do that in MATLAB, to draw a curve. So the problem here is how do we find the coefficients A, B, C, D? And guess what? We can find them by solving a system of linear equations, right? So, so the one thing uh, that might confuse you at the first glance is that it doesn't look very linear, this <coughs> problem. Right, I have the x cubed, I have x squared here. But those are certainly not linear functions, right? But the cool thing is that these nonlinear functions, like the third degree power or second degree power, they apply to the data. X, x's are known, right? I said those are my inputs. I know where my points are, right? I know what the x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on, what they are, right? So you compute the computing the second and third power it doesn't matter. The problem we are solving, that is linear because the values are linearly dependent. The, the values of the polynomial are linearly dependent on the coefficients A, B, C, D, and that's what we are solving for. We are solving for the A, B, C, D. So what matters the linearity with respect to the unknowns? 
Okay, that's, 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 that's good to realize, by the way. If there were some sines and cosines of the axis, it absolutely wouldn't matter, it will work still the same, right? And to do, to recover the coefficients of my four degree polynomial, what I do, I just write um, all these uh, powers of x in the matrix like this. So this, this, this says that the first point, after I multiply with the right coefficients, it gives me y1, the same for y2, y3, and y4, right? And unless I have some degenerate case, I like put all axes at the same point, in which case I certainly cannot compute the unique solution, right? Then I will get an invertible matrix and I can compute A, B, C, D, just inverting one four by four matrix. Everybody got it? Would you know how to code it up in MATLAB? <laughs> no, why not? <laughs> What I, would, what I would give you, or what you could come up with, you, you can just make up these, these pairs, x1, y1, right? You could just come up with something like this, right? You would just say this is, I guess I would start by saying this is one, two, three, and four, coming at some values for y. Then all you need to do in MATLAB is to form the powers, form the matrix of this, put the right-hand sides into a vector, do backslash, and there you are. Just, it, it would take like five minutes. And then you can plot the polynomial, which would be nice, smooth, infinitely smooth, infinitely differentiable function, interpolating the points. Everybody got this? The next example is interpolation in 2D. So it's sort of, I guess, a generalization of that case. So I guess you can look at this as interpolation in 1D. Like uh, here, here I was basically looking at a 1D function. So in 1D, I mean function from R to R, right? It took a real number and produced a real number. Interpolation in 2D is even better because what, what it does, it takes a function Z, which is a function from R2 to R, or you can look at it as a function of two arguments, Z, X, and Y, okay? And let's, let's take a quadratic function now in uh, 2D. By the way, do you have an intuition how a 2D quadratic function looks like? We'll be talking about this more later, but you might have an intuition already. Let me ask you this, uh, how a 1D quadratic function looks like, <coughs> if it's not degenerate. It could be degenerate, in which case it would be just a linear function or a fine function. You know how these look like, uh, they are lines, right? We, we, we had this before. So how does, a, just an intuition, how does a 1D quadratic function look like? Parabola, right? It's some sort of ball like this. Or it could be like this, right? Or it could be like very wide. Or it can completely de degenerate to a line. That's 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 where you have the zero, zero element on the quadratic term, zero coefficient with the quadratic terms, right? So that would be the one D quadratic function, and two D quadratic function. That's exactly what we have here. So there are some coefficients, some real numbers. I guess I can put it like this: A, B, C. C, D, E, F are just scalars. Everything is scalars here. X and Y are also scalars. X, Y are, those are the parameters of the function. So the idea is that the X and Ys, I have some coordinate system, right? There's my X and Y. And the function assigns a value to every point on the plane. Right. It's a quadratic function because there is X squared, X times Y, Y squared, and the affine component, the linear part, and the constant translation. So do you have an intuition how the function looks like? Yeah, 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 you could, yeah. So you could look at it like this, right? If, if, I, if I plotted the isovalues, the one, uh, one way I sort of like to think about this, you can imagine that's like a height field, like imagine like a mountain, like ter terrain or something like this. And the value of the function is the height at, at, this, at this point. I guess I like to think like graphics, you like terrain, which you can like render and everything, right? If you look at it as a, as a 3D thing, right, like, then basically these things are like some sort of balls, right? Or it could be the other way, ball, <laughs> with, with different curvatures. That's, that's what they are. <coughs> there can be some more funny cases in the 2D case, some sort of settles, but we will leave that discussion for later. Let's think about now how do we interpolate points in 2D. So again, the setup, I guess, is very similar. I give you a few points in 2D. It would be x1, y1, right? Would be x2, y2. That would be, I guess, a few more. 
I guess I should give you six, right? So one, two, three, four, five, and the last one would be x6, y6. Okay. And this, the task is similar to what we had before. And now I give you also the values on each of the points. So there will be some z1 here, z2 here, and so on up to some z6 on the last point. And I want, to, want you to find a quadratic uh, 2D function that interpolates these z values. Everybody sees that? And how does it relate to the 1D case? I guess I could do some better visualization or something like that, but uh, I rely on your mental picture of the things. So again, so, any, sorry? Correct, yes, 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 exactly. I don't have the matrix written on if, if we wanted, we could just write it, it would be exactly the same idea. So let's talk about how, how to solve it, right? If, if I have, so those are again my data, the x's and x, y's and the, all the z's, those are my data and my, my unknowns are a, b, c, d, e, f and I form a system of equations and this then would be six, times, six by six matrix, right? And six values on the right hand side Again, I hit backslash in MATLAB and solve for A, B, C, D, E, F, okay? So those were some very simple examples. Let's do a more interesting example, sort of phys physics-based. I guess this could be like sort of like a brief introduction to physics-based uh, simulation, if you will. So we will look at stretchy rope. You know, let me explain it by scribbling a little bit. So let's do stretchy rope. Sort of. So let's let's see. So we have a rope which is consisting of some nodes and links between the nodes. Okay, I guess think about it like a bridge or something. And each of the nodes has y coordinate. This would be y one, y two, y three. Y4, Y5, and Y6, or I guess in general YN would be the last one. So my model of this stretchy rope is, is looks like this, and each of each of these nodes is a particle which can move up and down. And the, the coordinate of the going up and down is the Y. That's a scalar, right? Let's let's say that the Y axis, I guess I could have axes here. The axis the X axis doesn't really matter. But let's say that y going uh, y positive means that the particle goes up, and y negative means it goes down. And the model is set up such that it cannot really go left and right. It can, it can only go up and down to make it to make it simple. <coughs> okay. So now uh, let's give it some sort of simple uh, physics model. So I guess let me go. Let me uh, do the first. Right here. So what we are modeling here is a stretchy rope, just been divided into n sections. Each section has some weight, uh, m kilograms, whatever m is your parameter. And we can sort of create some sort of model for forces. So the idea is, and this is better to draw, the idea is that the rope is getting stretched somehow. So there are some external forces acting on it, which make the rope stretch <coughs> to, some, to some configuration like Oops, like like this. I want to come up with a simple model for these uh, for the elastic forces. So um, let's look at let's look at the first link. So let's assume I have something like this. So this would be my coordinate y one, and this would be my y two. So in this case, y would be negative because I'm pulling pulling it down here. So the force uh, acting on this node due to this segment, basically I, I want some sort of, the idea is to model some sort of restorative force. I want something that pulls this back to the rest pose, okay? So the force uh, in this case will be restorative force because it wants to restore the, the rest pose. That would be K times Y1 minus Y2 where K is some spring stiffness, okay? 
So the idea is uh, I can have a parameter how stiff the bridge is. If K is really large, that means that these pieces are really stiff. If K is small, that means that they are very soft um, springs. So notice one thing. So if if y1 is larger than y2, then this restorative force will be pointing up, and that's that's what I want, right? If it was the other way around, if, if y2 <coughs> was above y1, then the force will be pointing down. So indeed, that's sort of pushing pushing it in in the right direction. So if this was stretched, if, if this link gets stretched, this force will be pushing it back to this rest pose, okay? And I'm talking about force acting on this link. So the force uh, sorry, force acting on this node due to this link. Okay, if I have, if I look at the other link and I have some y3 here, so that would be, I guess I can put the y axis here, the way y axis, I have y3 here. So here is my y3. <coughs> so the force that uh, is uh, that acts on this node from this link would be, guess, guess what it would be. <laughs> would be quite similar to this, right? So here I have to look at the, this, how much is stretched this link that's given by y3 <coughs> and y2, right? That's, that's my model here. So that would be, is someone of the same? Yeah, y3 minus y2, right? Again, let's check if it points in the right direction. So if y3 is more than y2, then this will be positive and will again be pulling it up. So that's correct, right? Because if this one is stretched down, it wants to pull it up. That's the that's, that's basic idea of a spring. Okay, uh, so we will do some more things to make it actually like a, like a reasonable physical model. So, the, so what I will do is I will basically say that these two uh, corner guys are attached to a wall, so they can't really move. So I basically say that y1 must be equal to y and must be equal to zero. So these, these particles will be pinned down, okay? And on the other particles, I will say that there is a gravity force acting. So gravity force will be equal to minus mg. Why minus? Because my y goes up, so I want the gravity to pull, pull down, and m is the mass of every link. Or I guess I, every node, I think that's a, better, that's a better way to think about it. So the total force Acting on node two will be just sum of all the forces, right? So that that means k times y one minus y two plus k times y three minus y two minus mg, right? So I'm looking what forces are acting on this link. This is the force. Sorry, node. I keep sorry. So this is the this is the force due to the first link. This force is due to the stretchiness of the or spring force due to the second link, and there is a gravity which is always pulling it down. Okay. So are we ready for the slide? And to make it even more interesting, I will say that on one of the nodes I will put a bigger weight. I'll say that one of them I put some sort of big big weight like this, with weight m kilos. Okay. And what I'm interested in is solving the balance of this structure <coughs> of equilibrium configuration. So equilibrium means that all the forces are balanced, so there is no more dynamics going on. You know from, maybe you know from Newton's laws of motion, if there are some, some non-zero forces that, that basically sets acceleration and makes things move, but um, <coughs> if you imagine I put some weight on it, maybe the rope was like bouncing for a while, but after some time it will settle. It will settle in a configuration where the sum of all the forces on every node is zero. Right. So the, the first one, the last one, they are out of it. They, they, they are here, the wall will exert whatever force I push on it so that the thing cannot move. So the forces on Y1 and Yn will be always zero. And the forces on all the other links look like this and I will want all of them to be zero to find an equilibrium configuration, right? That creates an interesting problem. 
because it models some sort of, it's a simple phys physical model, but it models some sort of almost real world structure. I guess it would be good physical model in case these dis displacements, the, the y's were small. Okay, let me, do you have any questions on that? Let me go through, let me summarize this. Uh, that's what's done on this slide. I have to rely on my handwriting. So I, I basically said this before, right? Those are the forces acting on the nodes. So I explained to you how, how it's derived. The idea is that the more the link is pulled, the higher the force. Then we have this additional weight of capital M kilograms hanging from one of the elements and the two extreme ones are fixed, okay? And now the cool thing is we want to solve for the equilibrium, given, giving all these um, forces acting on the system. <coughs> so for uh, every <coughs> node, which it doesn't happen to be, for, that's for every regular node without any exceptions, right? That was the case of the Y, this was the formula for the Y2 node. If I write it in general for node number I, I get this. This is the force from the left link, force from the right link. This is the gravity, that was minus mg, so I put it on the right hand side, why not, right? And the, ex the node that has the extra weight, that's, that's the same equation except it gets M plus capital M, okay? And the two ones on the boundary, that those are these equations, that's just Y1 equals zero and Yn equals zero. Those are also perfect equations, right? And then you can assemble the system. I will, I think I will show the system on one of the following slides, but you, you should be able to sort of figure out the, the structure of the matrix. It's not that difficult. And then uh, figure out how to put it in MATLAB and compute such an example. Maybe I'll do like a home, homework project like, like this. Maybe a fun one. Okay, here I wanted to, uh, before we go to the next example, which is basically a 2D version of this, and that's, that's where it starts getting even more cool. By the way, what, 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 what would you expect as a solution if, if, if I did, did this? I'm not sure what I would expect as a solution, but think about it. Oh yeah, you'd probably expect something if you just let the rope settle, right? Something like this, right? And maybe one of them which has the, which has the large mass, maybe there'll be some imbalance due to the large mass, right? So you would sort of expect, but you will never know until you actually try it. <laughs> By the way, this is really a uh, oversimplified model of forces because they are basically li linearized forces. But models like this are quite often used in engineering because if the displacements are not too large, this is actually not too bad of a model. Like if you are like computing like a real bridge, you probably will not have some sort of crazy oscillations. We will only small displacements. And in that case, this model is actually pretty good. So here I want to, before I go to the next slide, uh, which is about the Poisson <coughs> equation, which is essentially the generalization of this to the 2D case. So before you get scared with these symbols, I want to connect, uh, I want to connect this to the continuous uh, representation and to calculus, this thing. Because believe it or not, this has a very direct and very cool connection to calculus. And I promise some of you to also explain some, or re-explain some basic calculus because um, some of you are better than, it, than others. Does anybody see how this is connected to some derivatives and stuff? Does anybody know that? So let me let me try let me try this way. Let me try uh, let's let's take this and divide this by k, right? I can certainly do that. So I'll get y i minus one minus y i plus y i plus one minus y i equals m g divided by k. No big deal, right? I just did a very simple transformation. Um, now I can sum these two. Right, so what I will get is this equals mg divided by k, right? And this might look a might look familiar. Have you seen anything like this before? In particular, this this stencil I'm multiplying the y's with. <coughs> this here is here I'm multiplying with one here by minus two and here again by one. One minus two one. It's a very special stencil. 
Okay, so this is new for you, so I will explain it uh, properly. So this essentially is a 1D Poisson equation. So I want to explain it first before I go to the next, even cooler example, which is about 2D Poisson equation. And basically, what <coughs> forget about this for now. What this is, is a discrete approximation of second derivative of second derivative of some function <coughs> equals some other function, okay? So let me do a quick derivatives crash course because uh, that's what I promised. So I guess before we talk about the second derivative, it's probably polite to talk about first derivative first. <coughs> The thing is that all these applications in linear, linear algebra, or most, or plenty, or the most interesting applications of linear algebra, they come from calculus or some scientific computing, and uh, the derivatives are the very basic building block of that, right? Some of you, I would hope, know this, but uh, let's take a look at it real quick. So let's assume I have a 1D function from R to R looks something like this but I'm not gonna do any fa fancy math I'll just give you the idea say the function mm. let, okay, let, okay let me try again this was not the best example oh you know what let's put, let's put a point here that will that will work so let's say I have a point x here and that's the value of my function fx is this okay and what uh, all calculus basically is about is establishing uh, local affine approximations. So I am for some reason interested in the behavior of this function, which can be complicated, a nonlinear function, whatever. But I'm interested in approximating in nearby x by an affine function. So affine function means linear function plus translation, right? So I'm looking for g from r to r, which is affine. Or let's do linear. I'll put the constant aside. And I want, if I do some small displacement around x, if I do fx plus h, then I want this to be approximately equal fx, that's the value of f at x, plus my linear approximation g. Okay. So because g, let me, because g is linear, that means that I can write G like what? That's a 1D linear function, so that's something really simple. Arbitrary scalar times H, right? So I can put like alpha H, where alpha is an arbitrary scalar, right? And what is the alpha? Alpha is the slope of the linear function, right? Uh, linear functions are really super, they're just lines, right? If my slope is zero, it looks like this. If slope is one, looks like this. Slope is two, looks like this, and so on, right? You, you certainly know that. So the question is, if, I, if I'm given an arbitrary function and I'm given the point x, how do I find the slope of the optimal linear function that best approximates this? That's basically the idea of the derivative, right? So then I say the derivative of x, f at point x, that's this f prime of x, that's this slope. And that's what is the first derivative. <coughs> now if I gave you a function and gave you for a homework, like try estimate compute a derivative somehow, what, what would you probably do? What you could do is take some, some h, which you consider a sufficiently small, do x plus h, compute the value of the function here, that would be f x plus h here, right? And then you could compute an estimate by doing this triangle. So that triangle, what it means is subtracting f x plus h minus f x divided by h. Everybody sees why this is an estimate of the derivative? For some small h, pick like 0 0.1 or whatever whatever your units are, right? 
and the point the idea of a derivative is that as the h gets smaller and smaller as you go closer and closer to x you're approaching to the derivative so the math way i guess i will allow myself a little bit of a math stuff is to write this like this so this is the formal definition of a derivative of function x at the function f at point x i'm taking better and better approximations of the slope of the function at this point and the ideal one is, is that optimal, the right one is the derivative. Okay, so I guess most of you already know this. Now, the important thing is if, so continuous function is a mathematical idealization, right? So if our function is sampled, so I don't have a continuous mm -hmm. function, but I only have a discrete set of samples, <coughs> f x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on. This can be pretty dense sampling, right? So now, now, now this is just a discrete approximation of the function. So I have some points somewhere which sort of, because you can imagine they sample the function, right? And if you assume this is dense enough, I sort of put there like lots of spacing, but you can imagine that you have like really lots of these points, no problem. You can have as many as you want, typically. How would you approximate the derivative of the function at point x1? If I give you the samples of the function at some discrete uh, sampling, let's say that the difference, the distance between x1 and x2 is h, that all of them are h, h apart. How would you approximate the first derivative given this discrete sampling of the function? This, this is basically the, this is, this is the key, right? So what you have, you have fx1, that's, that's, that's here, <coughs> fx2, that's here, fx3, that's here, and so on. So who dares to tell me the discrete approximation of the function at, po at point x1? And the disclaimer is that there is a lot, yeah? Yes. <laughs> okay, um, so let's just fx2. Exactly. Yeah. That's basically exactly what I was writing here, right? You just translate it to this uh, discrete settings. So you said x2 minus x1, which is fine. So let's simplify it and say that the distance between every xi and xi plus 1 is just h. So I can just write it like this just to make that a little bit simpler. That's, that's exactly what I had here, right? I was, that basically means that you assume that the, the values of the function between x1 and x2 are just linearly interpolated, which is, if you don't know any better, that's, that's uh, as good an as, as assumption as any, right? So this would be my approximation of the first derivative at point x1, something like this. And if this h is relatively small and the function does not it's not too wild, then this will be a good approximation, okay? This is called sometimes the finite difference approximation of a derivative, okay? Now here, I, now I need to get to a second derivative. And second derivative, maybe it sounds scary, I don't know, does it sound scary? I hope not. Second derivative means just a derivative of a derivative. Because this f prime is, is another well-defined function, so I can just apply the same thing again to the derivative and what I get is a second derivative, right? I guess if you wanted a formal definition, I can write it right here. That would be just exactly the same thing, just applied to the first derivative, x plus h minus f derivative x divided by h for h going to zero. And you will get second derivative. You could get third derivative and so on by repeating the same idea. Just differentiating. The derivative itself is a function, so I can differentiate it again. Okay. Now what I'm trying to get to is the discrete approximation of the second derivative. So let's do this. Let's take the discrete approximation of the first derivative. Again, back to the discrete case. That's where linear algebra kicks in, in the discrete case. And so this is, of course, approximately, you know that, x3 minus x2 divided by h, right? I just basically shifted myself one step to the right. Yep. So now I would like to find out what is the discrete approximation of the second derivative at x2. <coughs> Any 
ideas. So the basically what we do, we just repeat the idea again. So now we are dealing with a, with a discrete least sampled function. But I told you how I how to do first derivative, right? And if I told you how to do first derivative, you know how to do every derivative, or you, you already knew how to do first derivative. I didn't even have to tell you that. So to compute the, the second derivative, all I need to do is to do this, right? Take first derivative f at x2 minus the first derivative at x1 divided by h, okay? And if I plug in the, these things, so that would be fx3 minus fx2. Now it's divided by h squared. And if I plug in the f, wait a second. Oh yeah, fx1, I'm plugging in this. That would be minus fx2, I guess minus fx1, divided again by h squared, okay? So let me simplify this a little bit. So this is one over h squared. And what I have here is fx3 minus fx2 minus fx2 plus fx1, which is one over h squared fx3 minus two fx2 plus fx1. <coughs> okay, does this look familiar to something <laughs> the stencil one minus two one appears here again okay and that's not a coincidence that's because what we had here in the stretcher rope example see the one minus two one stencil because this was exactly the discrete approximation of the second derivative let me give you an intuitive explanation of what at least the discrete second derivative does. Interestingly, it is uh, get another paper. It is basically a measure of curvature. So let me explain that a little bit better. So let's start with this. So I guess I could further I could further. Um, modify this to this following form. So I guess I can divide the whole thing by two. And then I can say that this would be one half of fx1 plus fx3 minus fx2, okay? In the stretcher of this would be just y1, y3, y2. It's just a different notation. Do you see what is happening here let me let me try to draw like an example so these are my discrete samples x1 x2 and x3 and let's assume that my uh, function values look like this that they are like on a line so this this would be my fx1 this would be my fx2 this would be my fx3 how much is the second derivative of f f at x2 or the to find a difference approximation of the second derivative at x2. In this case, when all, all these are on the line, let's take, take a look what's, what's happening here. This means take fx1 and fx3 and do an average, okay? And this is the, dis the subtract the average from fx2, okay? If I am on a, on a line here, and the average of fx1 and fx3, that's exactly fx2, right? Because I'm averaging in like this y, y axis, right? So in this case, what is the second derivative approximation at x2? Zero, exactly. Because it's a straight line. If I did something like this, x1, x2, x3, same, same idea. And it looked like this. Let me put there like lines to sort of like linearly interpolate my <coughs> points. That could really be whatever. That's so what is the discrete approximation of the second derivative at x2? Well, let's let's follow this recipe, right? So this is fx1, this is fx3. So I do an average. Here is here is the average of the two. And then I subtract to fx2, right? This is what I get. In this case, 
it's a positive number, right? So in this case, the discrete approximation of second derivative is greater than zero. See that? What if it was the opposite case? What if it was something like this? Oof. Oof. And something like this. What do you think I would get in that case? <coughs> exactly, negative number, because it, it's flipped. So from this, you can see, I guess, the geometric interpretation of the second derivative. It's basically a measure of curvature. If you have a linear function, you get zero. We put it here for completeness. Second derivative x2 is zero. If it's positive, it means positive curvature. So the functions would look like bowls. And if it's negative, then the functions would look like uh, hats. <laughs> OK, Th this is very beautiful, I think. By the way, this also tells you a measure of curvature. Now, what if, uh, if, if you had some function like this, what do you think would be the curvature here compared to curvature here? So that would be point A and point B. That's right. In both cases, it would be positive, right? Because it's bowl shape. But the curvature at A would be much larger than here, right? That's a, that's, that's a beautiful tool. So I guess that's what I would like you to remember today, that the second derivative actually has this beautiful geometric interpretation of measuring curvature. Okay. So y'all. Well, let's go to the plus one equation example. Yeah, I guess I need to do a little bit more explanation in the 2D case. So the Poisson uh, equation, this is, uh, is employing what's called the Laplace operator. You know what? I think I need to do a little more explanation in the 2D case. <laughs> you might not like it otherwise. So let's think about what does it mean for 2D function. So when I'm in the situation, like in the 2D interpolation before, when I'm on a plane, but now I'm looking at a function, f at functions from R2 to R. So here I'm assigning Think about it, you can think of it either as assigning height values to each point of the plane or color values. So now I have function z, x, and y. And in this case, I need to talk about partial derivatives. So I guess today you have like a crash course to calculus <laughs> or a recap of calculus in the better case <coughs> when you had some calculus before. So we talk about partial derivatives of the function. There are two partial derivatives in the plane by x and by y. Does somebody know what it means? If, I have, if I'm at a some point, let's call it point x and point y. Let's, let's get rid of these. I don't, I don't need these. Does, some, does somebody want to tell me what is the partial derivative? Exactly. So the answer was change in just the x direction or the y direction. So one way I guess you can look at it a little more formally is that you can just look. If, so I'm interested in this point, right? What I can do is basically like cut a line here. So I have some, imagine I have some height field going on here, right? And I can just restrict myself to this line. Look what the height field is, is doing, right? So I guess formally, how could I write it formally? I guess formally I could write a like z, uh, y of, P would be my Z, which would be X, and the T would go for, oh, I think I did it over the other way, sorry. Z, X, T equals Z, T, Y. Well, I'm confusing myself. I want to say that I fix one of the parameters and I let the other one to wear it. So what is the right way to do that? <coughs> Oh, I think this is actually correct. So that this should be called that y and this should be called that x. 
So the idea is that I basically fix the, the either the y or the x axis. So in this case, I fix the y. So that would be my zy function. And I just compute the normal derivative of the function zy at the point x. Okay. In the other case, I would just look at this line here, passing through here. Look at what the height field is doing. This would give me the partial derivative with respect to y axis. Okay, did it make some sense? So basically it's the same idea, except to par partial means that I'm looking I either at the x direction or y direction of the 2D function. And I guess if you wanted to define formally, then the partial derivative of z by x would be defined as the derivative of the zx function. No, the z of y function. I think I did a stupid notation, but it's okay. Which would be zx by t. So I restrict myself to the 1D function and take a regular derivative there. Okay. So yeah. the constant. Hmm? T is the constant. No, T, T, was, T was supposed to be the argument and the X is the value I, I fixed there. Oh. Shall I? Okay, let's, let me go through it once again. I guess I'm so already late. I'm confusing myself. So here I meant that I fixed the X. So, so I'm looking at this function and the T is going in the Y. So it's indeed traversing this. Okay. So this one gives me the partial derivative with respect to y. I think I should have chosen the symbol differently. But <laughs> Don't mind the symbols. Mind the fact that I look at the 1D one, one function here, 1D one, one function there, compute their derivatives. That's, that's the main idea. And I can certainly do the same thing for second derivatives, right? And if I do this for second derivatives, I can create a very cool thing which is called the Laplace operator for a 2D function, and which is denoted usually as like this. In some cases, that's just a notation like this. And it's defined, I guess, definition. That's just mean it's defined as the second derivative of the function z by x and the second derivative of the same function by y. So, so the Laplace operator is the sum of the second partial derivatives with respect to x and y. And guess what happens in the discrete case? In the dis discrete case, these, these things are all quite simple. So if I have the function discretized on like a regular grid, equal spacing of h and I'm interested in computing the value of the Laplace operator at this point so let's say the function is discretized using values phi i minus 1 j this would be phi i j this here would be phi i plus 1 j here would be phi i j minus 1 there would be phi i j plus 1 turns out that I don't really need the other ones so to compute the first derivative, sorry, the second derivative in with respect to x, I apply the one minus two one stencil to phi i minus one j, phi i j, phi i plus one j. And to compute the second partial derivative in the y direction, I use the stencil here. So I multiply this by one, this by minus two, and this by one, okay? It's already late, so I don't wanna write everything down. But I will write down the final formula. So the discrete approximation of the Laplacian at this point is this. So I guess I could do like Laplace of phi at ij is phi i minus 1j plus phi i plus 1 j plus phi i j plus 1 plus phi i j minus 1 the whole thing uh, sorry that's wrong there should be this there should be 
minus 4 times phi <coughs> ij. Okay, I don't think I have enough time to explain in the last three minutes properly, so I think I will revisit it the next time. Hopefully it will be it will come out better. It's already getting late, so <laughs> let's stop it right there. I will clarify the next time. <coughs> it's not difficult to deal. Okay. Any questions you guys got before? Stop? Okay, so let's stop here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.